And I just finished watching the newest episode of Lovecraft and I am pleasantly surprised. I think if you read the book, it stayed true to the essence. And if you haven't read the book, it has gotten you invested enough to move on because that first episode was so good. So uh, overall, I was very happy. And the episode starts off in such contrast to the last, right? You see Letty, you see George, and they're kind of having the time of their lives. And automatically, there's a few red flags, right? So they just got here and, you know, they were covered in blood. They didn't know where they were. They just gone through all this trauma. And all of a sudden, they got comfortable pretty quick, right? You see Letty trying on everything. She's, you know, really, she's really comfortable. She seems really happy. George is sitting on the bed, just reading everything under the sun. And automatically, there's a problem, right? They're like, this is nice, but I don't know if I... After the monsters, it's hard to kind of wrap your brain around it. And then all your suspicions are confirmed when you look at Atticus, who just seems disjointed, right? Like he's not really happy, he's not really settled, and he has these flashbacks of these monsters. At the end of the last episode, they were welcomed into the house by this guy named William. And William is a peculiar character that we'll touch on later, but he's not really a butler, right? Like he's more of a consigliere, he's more of an advisor, specifically to Christina Braithwaite, but that's a whole other thing. So Atticus and his friends were basically told that his father would be here soon, Montrose, and that he went on business with Mr. Braithwaite to Boston, which is automatically a red flag because Boston is code for racist, right? Like, it's just, I just got, you know, a quiet American vibes. Like, why is he going to Boston? Like, it's already perplexing and it seems like they're playing a waiting game. Like this William, this blonde haired gentleman that has, seems to have many functions, is kind of stalling, right? He's kind of like making them as comfortable as possible and everything seems as it should be. And to, it's, it's really creepy, right? Like George kind of mentions the fact that every book he's wanted to read is in that library. Like it's almost catered to him. Every, all the clothes that Letty tries on fits her like a glove, it fits her style. And honestly, she looks fantastic. Atticus, we don't know what's in his room because he didn't really look right, like he's not interested. And again, this William guy is distracting, right? So he's walking them around the house. And the sort of issue that, or the central conflict in this whole series is introduced. William takes them around the house and he introduces them to the family history of the Braithwaite. And the whole point of Atticus coming to this house is to kind of uncover his own an ancestry. Or at least that's what he's been told by his father in this letter that he may or may not have written. And William kind of says this house is built on, you know, a fortune through, I think it was shipping. And shipping is code for, you know, slavery. And William is talking about, you know, the family history and specifically the founder. He kind of makes the point of saying that this guy was really nice to every single person who worked for him. And he was a really generous person and he really kind of gave his all. And the most important kind of facet of information here was the fact that the house was burned down and that everybody had died in a fire. And the only person who had survived is this slave named Hannah. But we'll get to that later. So the house burned down and everything along with it, and they were able to kind of rebuild it. And the implications of that are going to play itself out, I think, as the episodes go on. But with that being said, so Atticus is on full watch and he can't really sit still, right? Like same as the last episode, he, he starts to investigate and immediately he finds out why Letty and George are kind of acting a fool. It's because they don't remember anything. And this conversation at the breakfast table is really cute because she's like, what happened last night? Like they can't remember. It's almost like they've been MIB'd and a flash kind of came to them. And they, it's like everything from last night is gone. Like all they remember is showing up at the house and having the time of their lives. And Atticus is like, you don't think that's strange? Like you don't think this and that? And thank God for Uncle George because he kind of like, although he doesn't remember, he does, he, he's very aware of everything around him. Unlike the other two. And this William character is not only there to distract, but he's also there to watch them, right? So he notices that this butler or whoever this advisor guy is, is kind of watching them and they kind of sit down. And Atticus is just, he's just a ball of energy, right? He's like, we have to investigate. And so they go into the town and they investigate. And this investigation is really funny because George and Letty are not sure, like they kind of believe Atticus to a certain point, but the monsters was, it's a bit ridiculous, right? And, they kind of go, well, maybe it's his PTSD, like maybe it's his war and maybe it's all this and that. And he's kind of looking at them. He's like, no, I saw the monsters and I did see this. And when you kind of listen to him in isolation, the monsters don't make sense. So I can understand Letty and George. But then when you look at the environment around them, the monsters make a lot more sense, right? So you have this house filled with like very finely dressed people. And then this community of like Amish people and they all seem like docile, right? Like they all dress the same. They seem like extras out of a video game, like 
they don't really seem like real people and nobody's even looking at them, right? Like you have three black people walking around a predominantly white neighborhood and they don't really notice, right? They kind of pass by and yeah, and this is, this is like the vibe is already strange and everything's so eerily calm. And this calmness is kind of broken apart by this female sheriff because they're kind of investigating because Atticus is pretty sure that his father is not in Boston on business. And they kind of come to this, I guess, stone tower, which resembles kind of a panopticon or a prison of some kind. And, and this woman, in contrast to everybody else, is so angry, right? Like she's so, she's so much more aware, like she's very racist clearly, but you know, in comparison to everybody else around her, she's the only person who reacts to them. She's the only person who really sees them, right? So everybody else is kind of walking around them. And George and Letty, they're trying to look inside and they notice a bunch of dead meat hanging on the walls. And he kind of makes the point like, so have you seen anybody else around? And the sheriff is something else, right? She kind of makes an analogy of black bears saying how they're not that intelligent. Every now and then they might get past you, but overall, like, it's nothing more than you can handle. Loki saying that, you know, if you ever come back here, like, you're gonna be hanging meat, so you better be on your way. So, I mean, her racism was something else, but I think what was interesting is the, she's the only person who saw them and reacted angrily, which is in such contrast to everybody else. Whatever the reason, it was enough to convince George and Letty that there's something they're missing, and this triggers George, right? So George is somebody who knows more information than he should. He's always like one step ahead of the game. Like he has information that everybody else doesn't have. And Atticus has kind of done enough to convince him that, okay, like maybe there is something I don't remember. And he kind of takes us into the history of the Braithwaites, right? Because the whole premise here is that Atticus's father has been very interested in his mother's sort of family history. And this is something that he's obsessed over for a very long time, which brought him to this house. And Atticus kind of doesn't know much about the family history, right? Like he hasn't really made it his business. But George apparently has made it his business. So George, again, kind of reveals some family history that he had. He kind of kept to himself, it seems. And he kind of reveals the fact that the sole surviving individual that William had been referencing in his story time was a slave, perhaps, and that she had escaped pregnant through these woods. And Atticus is looking at George like, what else about me don't you know? Like, what else, what else are you hiding? Like, what else is the problem? And, and again, it's all about semantics here. Like, William, you can think of William as a kind of a PR person, right? Like, the people who work for him, like, the one sole survivor. Like, he can't say it was slaves or a female slave that ran out, right? But George can. And it seems like George has a lot of loose information that are being connected by being in this place. And the most important revelation here was the fact that Atticus and Montrose might not be related, right? Like Montrose might, might not be Atticus's father and the details of this have yet to be revealed but for me this was the biggest revelation and George reveals this on his deathbed, right? Which says a lot about his character. Like he's really not somebody who reveals things unless he's under extreme duress, which is true here, right? Like as soon as it's kind of proven that there's something he might not know or they, they could be in grave danger. Like now you're gonna tell me this? Like you can have told me this on the road? Like. You could have told me this, like, he really, I mean, snitches get stitches, right? Like, he, he does not say a word about any of it. And it seems like he has a very bad relationship with Atticus's father as well. Like, he kind of, he minds his own business to his own detriment. And this plays out at the end of the episode, right? So George's story time is cut short when these monsters reappear. And these monsters are not, they're not really, they're more like God, guard dogs, right? They're not really monsters. And they're not really there to protect the people in the house, right? They're there to prevent from people from coming in or out as they please, right? They're, they're there to make sure that things kind of go according to plan, and they do. So the story escalates and now, now we get to the point, right? So all this treatment, all this niceness, all this sort of hospitality is now taken away. This show is really good at like not beating around the bush. So Christina comes out of nowhere and she says, okay, fine, you can go meet my father. The whole point of this is that it seems like Christina and Mr. Braithwaite in this house is some sort of cult and they need Atticus specifically. Like his friends came along for the ride, but this was all a trap to lure Atticus in. Okay, so we're introduced to Mr. Braithwaite and I don't really know what to say about him. He reminds me of Leo DiCaprio in Django Unchained, except without the humor. And the first time we're introduced to him is his ribs are being taken out from inside him and he's screaming. And this says a lot about his character and just the people who live in this house, which is that they have their own reality, right? Like they inflict pain on others and if they want pain inflicted on them, like that's their choice, right? Like this is, no one really has the power to hurt them other than themselves. So this was a, a very appropriate introduction to who this guy is. 
And we find out in the scene that it actually wasn't Mr. Braithwaite who invited Atticus or he, who even cared about, you know, his whole lineage. It was, it was his daughter that invited him up. Right? And this, this information is important because there seems to be some type of conflict between father and daughter. And there seemed to be some sort of power dynamic or like a fight for power here. And the only reason Atticus, Atticus is kind of a ploy, right? He's kind of a, he's kind of a unicorn for Christina. Specifically because it seemed like the reason that he was brought up here or lured up here is that he's actually related to the original Mr. Braithwaite, I guess you could say. And again, this this Mr. Braithwaite is is quite a character, right? Like he has an intense God complex. He sees himself as literally Adam, and his goal is immortality, right? He he wants to find the formula or the secret or whatever it is to become immortal. Like he is really in his own head and he is just something else. So it seems like Mr. Braithwaite has been trying a long time to find, you know, how to be immortal and his and sort of bring his cult up and whether or not he's in competition with other cults or why the strive for immortality, we'll find out. But whatever the case, the guy is just, he is something else. And Christina's idea is that because Atticus is sort of a blood descendant of the original Mr. Braithwaite, they can kind of use his blood to sort of open the gates of Eden and return to paradise. Like that's what I got out of it. And again, Mr. Braithwaite, like he, he's kind of disgusted at the idea. Like the first thing he says to him is, you're a lot darker than I thought you would be. And he says that with such a straight face, like, oh, is this really gonna work? Like he kind of refers to him as tainted, like, and all these things, like you've been corrupted. Like I'm not even sure this is gonna work, but all this to say like, this was not his idea. And this will play out later as the episodes go on. So this woman, Christina, like I, I'm not really sure what to think of her because she kind of positions herself opposite to her father, right? Like she's a very calming figure. She kind of looks at Atticus like, listen, if you just get through this and give him what you want, like I swear I'll protect you as much as you can. So she seems to have this like white savior complex, but the only reason it's being broken apart is the fact that Atticus and none of his friends really believe her, right? And he kind of looks at her like, if you want to help me, you need to help me. And she kind of says, listen, you need to network and you need to do all these things. Like you don't have a lot of friends, which is kind of a ridiculous thing to say. Like Atticus and his friends have been attacked by monsters. They're here as sort of a, a chess piece, right? And he, he's kind of like, you want me to network with these people and make friends? Like, do you not see like, I, like bitch, are you blind? And she kind of, again, she sounds very rational, but this is her isolation, right? She's talking to him like somebody who needs her help when in fact the reason they're in this mess is because of her and this is not lost on him whatsoever and Atticus kind of picks up on her white savior complex and says okay if you're really my friend then please make them remember what happened and let me out of here like let my friends out of here and I'll let you do whatever I want and she kind of obliges him halfway through she you know she does enough but she doesn't really trust him right like she keeps him kind of locked up like he might not be in chains like his father was but I mean, she's still kind of holding them captive and kind of creating this false sense of security that doesn't exist. So this woman is something else. And again, she's not really, everything is like for your entertainment. And I think the eeriest scene here is when all these cult members showed up at the party and they're kind of watching Letty, George, and Atticus's hallucinations play out like as if it's on, you know, as if it's TV, right? As if it's some sort of like entertainment or a band playing. And although it's not like slaves fighting each other, like it was in Django, but uh, the same idea, right? And these hallucinations and these kind of spells that this woman keeps putting on them is to distract them, right? It's to keep them waiting. It's to, it's to kind of buy time until, until whatever it is she wants to happen, happens. And these hallucinations were, were really something else. And I think the transition to the hallucination made it even more eerie. So you see that Atticus is kind of locked away in his room. And then suddenly he's not locked away in his room. Like he's in, he's in Letty's room. And this was quite eerie because the first hallucination is with Letty and Atticus and each hallucination is like a fantasy, right? It's like their deepest, darkest fantasies. And this scene to me was the eeriest because you see a picture of, I guess, Adam. Adam is a sadist. Like this sort of flipping of Adam and Eve, I'll get to at the end, but I think it's really significant, especially when you get to how Atticus was able to kind of free himself from that situation without having the house sort of tumble on him. But while Letty is kind of living out her horrid fantasies, Atticus and George are kind of communicating via Morris code, which I thought was super cute and, and adorable. And they kind of make wizards or stuff like this. And Atticus compares these people to like the Ku Klux Klan. And 
which is but like rich right so george is flashback to me was the most interesting and it revealed the most because again he's been holding information back right like the bit about hannah the bit about like last episode with the picture in the wallet like there, there's stuff that he's not being fully forthcoming about and again each of these flashbacks or each of these fantasies is coming from like the deepest part of their minds so his flashback i believe was a montrose's wife and they're dancing and George, again, is a very smart character. Like, he notices everything pretty quickly and he's very aware of his surroundings, minus the diner. And he manages to find the secret portal in his room uh, through a book. So he's looking through a book and he kind of accidentally sort of triggers something that opens up a whole, a whole other corridor filled with more books. And this is important towards the end of the episode, but the book that kind of allows him to discover the secret corridor is, is interesting. And he explains that while he's dancing, with his sort of fantasy woman here. And the book basically describes a man who was in a haunted house who experienced a series of hallucinations. And the whole time he's describing this book, I don't know why I kept thinking of like 1408 with John Cusack and he was in that hotel room and he kept seeing things and he kept telling himself it wasn't real, but it was real, right? And George is the only one that knows that this isn't right, right? And as much as like, there, he's trying, as much as it tries to seduce him into the fantasy, he's never fully there, right? And he kind of looks the portal straight in the eye like he knows they're being watched, he knows there's something wrong. Now Atticus's flashback, I mean the guy is hiding something. So you have Jamie Chung's character this time in full uniform and they're fighting. And I think Atticus was either maybe a prisoner of war or he committed some type of, like I'm getting like killing fields vibes like he was witness to something or he's hiding some type of atrocity that he doesn't really want to fully discuss. And he's really traumatized by this woman, right? You have to wonder, like, because he did mention that, like, he did something bad during war and George is like, it is what it is, you're back home now, but something, something horrible is plaguing him and we'll find out later, right? So this party is something else, right? So the fantasies are over, the sort of previews, the, the fun and games are all done. And again, like, everything happens according to how this woman wants it to happen, right? So the hallucinations end when she wants them to end. Like they're allowed to leave their room when she wants them to leave their room. And again, the party is the climax. So they get to this creepy ass cult party and you see Mr. Braithwaite sitting there and Atticus and George are sitting in the back. And now you know why he was having self-inflicted surgery at the beginning. He, he basically says, you know, as Adam gave his rib to create Eve, I'm gonna give you my ribs to create this cult or kind of like let it be known that this cult is mine. And this Mr. Braithwaite, again, like he seems to have a God complex, like he really believes he's Adam and he really believes that he is divine, like he kind of, he's it, like he thinks he's the ish. But this, this is not the case and this is why he's so bothered by Atticus because George being the sort of sneaky sneak that he is kind of came across a book that stated sort of how the bylaws of this creepy cult works. And one of the bylaws was saying that it's according to bloodline. So whoever's closest to this old Titus is a person in charge. And they tested that theory out and Atticus gets up and says, you know, all of you need to get the fuck out. And honestly, I was a bit startled because I'm like, ooh, you know, maybe cults, but like they're still kind of racist. But I guess, I guess this cult is strong, right? Like the ideologies behind it is pretty strong and they really believe whatever crazy thing they're trying to do. And George's speech before Atticus kind of exits them out of the room is honestly like, this is some theater shit. Like he really kind of plays on their stupidity and their arrogance and Again, you have Mr. Braithwaite sitting there like Leo DiCaprio and he's just not amused, right? He's like, you need to sit down, you need to be quiet, you are not my guests here. And I think he's irritated because this was not his idea, right? This was his daughter's idea. The only thing I got out of this dinner scene is the fact that Atticus does like outrank all of them and that he has some sort of, like his bloodline is enough, like they can't even mistreat him, right? Like they mistreat his friends, but not him. And the fact that they all left the room except for Samuel tells you like, kind of how crazy these people are like samuel is not having it he's like listen maybe we need you but don't don't think you're indispensable like don't think you're this and that and atticus kind of goes out of his way of saying like bring me my father like i know he's around here and so although they can't really do anything to atticus they can do things to his friends so they set him up quite nicely here like again samuel's not having it like he wants to get to the point he's he's here he's a, he, he's he's a man of god right and so he tells him where Atticus's father is. Like, however they got there, we're not really sure, but it's assumed they were kind of led down this corridor. Like everything Atticus and his friends have done, they've been kind of given permission to do, right? So they find this 
hole that his father was buried in and we're introduced to Atticus, his father, as this very aggressive guy, right? Like he kind of, he, he kind of comes up from the ground and he thinks he saved himself, right? Like he thought he did this all by himself. And again, we knew that Atticus and his father would have some problems, but you know, Montrose was not having it. He was just like, listen, I don't know why you idiots came for me. Like, do you have eyes? Like, why would I write you a letter like this? Like, are you dumb or are you dumb? And like, this was a fight to get there, right? Like not only was he underground, but he was being guarded by this crazy sheriff lady that thankfully, Thankfully, God was coming to her, like she's dead and gone, but it was not for nothing, right? Like he wasn't released for nothing and they're trying to escape. And this was always kind of a silly endeavor because as I mentioned before, like everything, like the monsters, the sort of spells, the potions, everything there is to make sure that nothing gets into this place without their permission, which also means nothing gets out without their permission. And they're kind of cut short by Samuel and Christina. And Christina's kind of falsity is exposed here, right? Because the only way they can kind of get Atticus to do what they want is to kind of use his friends, right? So although he's immune, his friends are not immune. And Atticus is kind of begging Christina for help, right? She's like, you need to help us, like, you need to do this. And she's kind of standing there, like, docile because it doesn't interest her, right? Like, his friends don't interest her. What interests the two of them is him. This ritual, so he finally agrees, and the way they kind of kick off this ritual with Marilyn Manson and for those of you who don't like the soundtrack, like because this is pulp and that's this genre, like it is appropriate, like it's supposed to take you out of it, right? Like there is an air of ridiculousness to the whole, like there's an air of like, really, we're doing this? So the music is appropriate and the transitions are like, they make sense for kind of what you're watching, right? Like they take you in and out of the show to kind of be like, okay, this is crazy. And this conversation between Atticus and Christina, again, reveals Christina's kind of disingenuous nature because the only reason Atticus is even allowed in is because he's a man, right? So not only is he blood related, but in any situation, like he would actually have more right to join the fraternity than she would because she's a woman. And she's kind of using her womanness to like, you know, kind of side with Atticus being like, listen, we both have stuff in common. Like I can help you and all this stuff. And again, I don't trust her a hundred percent. And I don't like how she's being, she's framing herself, but I do like that he's not buying anything that she's saying. And the deal here is that they go through with it, we'll heal, we'll heal your friends and you'll be let out and everything will be fine. But of course that's silly, right? Like, what is that saying? Like, give an inch, take a mile. So we get to this ritual and this ritual is introduced to us through this voiceover titled Whitey on the Moon. And this is in reference to the moon landings, right? So while America has all this technology to kind of go on the moon and do all these things, meanwhile, people, are starving, they have poverty, people can't pay their health insurance, like this the contrast between America's promise and America's reality. And this is so appropriate because this is still relevant today, especially if you look at like something like Silicon Valley and just the enormous amount of wealth. And sometimes we think this wealth is at the expense of black Americans, but it's, but it's actually because of, right? Like, and that's what this whole ritual is showing, like, right? Like they're sucking the life out of Atticus. They are taking everything from him. They've kind of used his friends against him, like they're dangling their lives in order for this portal to be open and this white man can get immortality, right? So the reason all this is possible, the reason you're even able to have this space and you're able to kind of sort of pursue these endeavors is at the expense of the poor, right? And in this case of black people. So this, this was really appropriate. And I love these voiceovers and I hope they continue them in each episode. And so this portal to heaven is open, but it all goes horribly wrong. And the lesson here with the thing with Mr. Braithwaite, Braithwaite is that he flies too close to the sun, right? Some things are not for you. Some spaces are not for you to occupy. And his whole thing is that he's the person who's going to put everything in its place. And he is the person who should occupy this hierarchy, right? He is Adam. He is, he is as high up as you can go. And he is fighting to get back to Eden because all y'all like kind of ruined it for him. But you know, his own point was lost on him. And so the only reason Atticus is able to leave is that he gets a vision through the Garden of Eden of this pregnant, this pregnant slave, right? This is the Hannah that George was talking about. And it's significant that she was pregnant and I'll get to this in a minute. And he, this woman kind of guides him out, right? So Atticus in a fury of pain and frustration manages to just yelp and kill everybody in the room. And the spell goes wrong and it goes, you know, for someone like Samuel who's so sure of everything, you would think that he would have calculated calculated this. But why he wasn't able to, again, like it wasn't his idea to use Atticus, right? It was Christina's idea. But that's a whole other thing that will probably play out later. 
anyways, they're being guided out of the room and you're getting like images of the fire that burned down this place before and they're out of the room and the way Atticus kind of runs out of that house like you know this isn't Tom Cruise right like you're not like he really he really ran for his damn life and just the look on Hannah's face was just like you're gonna make it but you need to like you need to run faster so he managed to escape barely with his life but unfortunately like George was not able to escape with his because the whole promise here was that if he was able to kind of do this then Samuel would kind of bring George back to life and heal this gunshot wound, which clearly he didn't do. But we'll see how that works out. You know, this was this ending was it was interesting because it leaves you on a cliffhanger that will be resolved in the next episode. But also, there's a lot going on here, like specifically the inversion of the Adam and Eve story. And I thought it was interesting that Atticus saw a pregnant Hannah. And I had a professor like, this is just a, a tangent, but. He was working on a paper and he was saying that like an idea that like this it just kind of made me remember this is that maybe the reason that eve ate the apple was to because she was pregnant right like to feed her baby like it wasn't it wasn't a selfish act it was actually a selfless selfless act and when you look at the images of adam throughout the house like he seems like a sadist like he seems like a guy honestly he just seems like a domestic abuser like and then you look at Mr. Braithwaite, who he's, he's just kind of out of his mind. And like, if this is Adam, then like, like who's the real evil here? And I, I did like that inversion because again, I think everything here is leverage, right? Like they're kind of using their fear to leverage these, to leverage Atticus and his friends to do whatever it is this cult wants, but we'll see how that plays out. But overall, this was a very good episode. I think it stayed very true to the book in terms of like the essence of where the story is going. How they'll kind of pick up in the third one, I'm not really sure. But overall, like, I'm happy. Let me know what you think. And until next week. Let her know, I gotta let her know That she my white horse, she my medical She like my baby mama, know how to take